Let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious God, continue to guide our journey in this Lenten season to remember your motto of faith that we are called to live out. Continue to inform us and direct us by your Holy Spirit, seeking to digest your word and live it out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. And yeah, this is good. Pastor? Yes. Oh, yeah, I'm going to refer to it a lot today if the PowerPoint's going to cooperate with me. Um, this, I don't know. It's one of those mornings. Why aren't you advancing? Yeah, um, I think 13, we're going to do... Ideally, today we should finish this packet. So we have, um, last time, we talked about uh, Peter's return to Jerusalem. Remember, we had the conversion of uh, Saul. Then we have uh, Peter's experience with Cornelius of the word being um, extended to the Gentiles. Then he goes back to Jerusalem. They want to know, hey, what's going on here? And he explains all that. And so with that then we sort of uh, conclude this section. It's really sort of the last we really hear what Peter is about in the book of Acts of the Apostles. It sort of ends here because now the rest of the time is going to switch over to um, the Apostle Paul and talk about his journeys and the spreading of the word through him. And, uh, you know, when we parted there uh, in the last... Uh, November, we had finished the first seven sections, and that was sort of the first quarter, if you will. So as this shifts, we are at now at another uh, place that naturally finishes as well. And so we're going to go ahead and um, play that part. I got the, this, the people that made that great video of one through seven have now sort of summarizing Acts chapter seven through 12. So I would like to play that now if the video is going to cooperate with me. Who has to learn that the way of Jesus isn't about gaining power, but giving it up. 
sets off there, starting the rest more calmly. And on the way, Saul has this sudden encounter with the risen Jesus himself. Jesus asks Saul why he's fighting again. And then Jesus commissions Saul to now represent him to Israel and to the nations. Saul is stubborn and speechless. And so he ends up in Damascus. But now he's announcing the good news about the Jesus he has just been attacking. And no one saw this coming. Oh, yeah. And the same goes. Okay, I think, like I said, I, I find that this does a good job of sort of summarizing that, and hopefully a lot of this is hitting home from what we've discussed, that you're starting to get like, hey, I really know what's going on in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. This is what we're talking about. We're hitting these same notes and so forth. Uh, two things about that video that I thought, uh, one correction that I, I wish, because I think it's done so well, the one thing is that when they have these experiences of Peter and the dream and Paul on the road to Damascus, they only have one figure in the uh, scene. And remember, in both cases, there are companions that are traveling with them. And we talk about how these eyewitnesses would have still been alive when people first read the book. So if you don't believe this happened to Peter or Paul, go ask those people that were along with them. So that would be one editorial correction that I would make to say, have people around seeing this happen, because that's the way um, Luke describes it in writing this. Uh, another point that I think that I didn't emphasize enough that I thought was well done in this is that we think about um, Paul, uh, Saul being this notorious person uh, with the Jews to protect the Jewish faith. But what I liked about the video is it brought out this sense of that if we look at the Old Testament and the story of the Israel, Israelites through this, that every time that they were taken over by a foreign nation, the battle became how much they absorbed culture and changed the purity of their religion. So we get a sense that Paul, being a loyal Jewish person, sees the Christian movement as not so much a threat to his own well-being or his status, but in his religious fervor, he's trying to protect what the scriptures uh, when the Jewish people went wrong before by adopting the other gods and other customs. And so he's out to save this and purify this from happening again. So it's not a motive of power or selfishness, 
but rather it is a motive to preserve the religion from being uh, going off course, going side, going into some sidetrack way and not being true to itself. And I, I think that's an excellent point in this. Okay, any questions on that before we turn to uh, chapter uh, 13 today? All right. So, what I would like to do is I actually am going to read the first um, uh, three verses here as we now are introduced to um, Saul going his way. Now, in the church at Antioch, there are prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Mannion, a member of the court of Herod the ruler, and Saul. While they are worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So here we go. Um, remember some key things about how Luke writes his and, and other people write things. Uh, first of all, we remember that when there's a listing of names... It often is by prominence or impact. Take a look at this, this list, and we have Barnabas listed first, and who's listed last? Saul. Okay, this is going to change. So it's interesting that in this initial spot, when there's a listing of names, Saul is the last one listed, not the first one listed. Okay? And uh, as the video talked about, um, this church in Antioch really becomes significant because we think about the church in Jerusalem as the headquarters as it was and where the founding of the movement happened, where all the significant events of Jesus' life happened, that in Galilee. But it's now north. It is now into foreign territory, if you will, where this, the, root, the church in Antioch becomes a major player in the spread of the gospel um, outside of Jerusalem. And this is, as uh, uh, the video mentioned, this sort of the beginning of an international church. These are people of all different areas. And if we just look at this listing here, um, we have people from all over. And um, Simeon called Niger, and that is a reference to uh, the word black here, meaning that this man was from Africa. Um, so he is from North Africa. We have Lucius of Cyrene. And um, we remember that that also, um, we talk about, that was way over, I don't have it in this map, but we talked about the map from before. That was on the north coast of, uh, to the Mediterranean Sea in Africa, and that's where Simon was from, remember, who carried the cross, who happened to be in Jerusalem because he was there to celebrate the Passover. So we have that area represented just in this little list. And then also we have this uh, man, uh, and again, we don't know, besides this list, um, these are sort of Jews who were um, part of the lineage ancestors who had been forcibly deported centuries ago that continued to practice of the faith. And then we have this um, Mannion, who is a member of the court of Herod, the ruler. So just in this listing of a few names, we get a variety, a diversity of folks who are major players in the church at Antioch in the spreading of the gospel. And so it's very diverse from the very beginning. All right. So um, they set off. They are uh, set apart. And we use this language even today in our, our faith, in Lutheran faith, when we talk about um, ordination. Now, it lists in here that there are some who are... Uh, um, prophets and teachers. There is sort of this sense that people have different roles in that, in that very first verse. And now in the church there are prophets and teachers, so people are gifted differently. But they are, um, the Holy Spirit, through their practice, and again, the mention of fasting again, how much that was practiced by the Jews and the early church as well. Um, but Barnabas and Saul are set apart, and this is language that we used in uh, ordination. We don't talk about it being set above. We talk about being set apart. 
And, you know, I like the graph that shows the, the image, you know, here's the cross, here's us as folks. Somebody that's a pastor or called leader of the church, they're set apart. They're not set above. And that's significant for us, particularly as Lutherans, because we think of our Roman Catholic friends who there is this sort of uh, level of the Pope being up close to God and all those kinds of things. That would be a difference of opinion in terms of one's righteousness. Um, I don't think Pope Francis would call himself perfect, but there is, a, a, an, I believe, an act they can do to say what I am saying is the authentic word of God with um, no mistakes. Uh, we would not trust any of our past Lutheran pastors to ever be like that. Um, we would not give that power away. Um, but there, there's an important significance to that in our theolo theological uh, uh, being. So uh, Barnabas and Saul are set apart, and what do the group do? They laid their hands on them before they went off. This, too, is still very much practiced in the church in different forms. Whenever somebody... Uh, there, there's a consecration, when there is an ordination. Uh, even during our affirmation of baptism and confirmation service, we practice this laying on of hands. Here it is, right from the very beginning of the church, this sense of practicing it. This became an uh, interesting point back. Uh, it's been, wow, geez, at least more than a decade now. Uh, the call, what was it the, with the Episcopal? The call to common mission, the call to whatever that was called, with the Episcopal Church. Yeah, there was a big, there was a wrinkle in that because it talked about succession of ordination that the bishop of the Episcopal Church needs to be present for an ordination because of the laying on of hands because they wanted this apostolic succession back to Peter that they believed in as the Catholics do that you know, it's the bishop who comes who himself was laid on hands, so that this laying on of hands continues um, back, and some would say unbroken to Peter, okay? You know, some may challenge that historically, but there was at least a theological sense that we want that, Let's, or, or um, want to subscribe to that for purposes of the Holy Spirit and this unbroken line. And the Episcopals practiced this, the Lutherans did not. And this became sort of a, uh, when, it, when this was passed, this came, got a lot of attention by the Lutheran churches. A lot of Lutheran pastors got up in the air about this because nobody's going to lay their hands on me. I don't care who did it and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Because what they did is they sort of grandfathered everybody in. If you didn't get ordained that way, now you were. And so, so people got upset about that. And... Um, so it was, you know, interesting how all that plays itself out in church politics and in church structure. But the sense of this laying on of hands to commission the Holy Spirit has at its earliest roots here at the very beginnings of the, the, the church. All right. Let's look at chapters uh, or verses um, 4 through 12, if somebody wouldn't mind reading that. Well, he was 
All right. So let's look at the map here a little bit. So if you see in the bottom right corner, we have Antioch. And then we have these other places mentioned. So let's see where we are in the travel as Barnabas and, and Saul set out. We go to Seleucia, okay, right there by the coast. And then they get on the boat. They go over to the island of Cyprus. And those are the two towns that are made there. Basically, coast to coast they go on this island of Cyprus proclaiming uh, the word. Um, and again, remember now, it's the, it's the Holy Spirit is the actor here. It's the Holy Spirit that is doing these things and driving their decision making, something that you know we're not necessarily used to. But verse 4, sent out by the Holy Spirit. And so they, they are going by God telling them which way to go. And it's interesting that they go to Cyprus first when they leave sort of the area. But if we remember, it's Barnabas and uh, Saul and Barnabas is from Cyprus. Okay, so they're sort of going to, he wants to go and tell his family, his people, his hometown about it. That sort of makes some logical sense in a place that they, well, let's pick next. So let's go, I know that place, let's go there. Uh, and, and they arrive, they, the first thing they do, and we're going to now see uh, this pattern develop. And so as we go into subsequent chapters, we're not going to spend as much time on it because we've sort of talked about this a little bit. And now we see this sort of beginning of this cycle that's going to repeat itself. The first thing they do is they go and find, hey, where's the local synagogue? Okay, because that's where they're going to find the Jewish people who are waiting for the promise, who know the story of the Old Testament, when that, again, every time they're arrested, they do these speeches before the court officials, they recap the, the Jewish officials, they recap the Jewish history and that becomes part of this cycle. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So they go there first. And then um, verse 5 talked about that uh, they have with them uh, John. So John is traveling with them. This is the John we talked about last time, John Mark, that we you know, connected with them and later becomes a, a, a division, actually, a source of disagreement between uh, Barnabas and, and Paul about presence of John Mark, so we're going to hear a little bit more about him uh, later. So he's with them to assist them, uh, and so when they get as far, they're, as they're going as far as Patphos, they meet a certain magician. We talked about this other magician last time, a sorcerer. These, these people, like, um, gain power. We don't know much about these people except that their name, he sort of has two names. Um, Bar-Jesus means the son of Bar, when somebody's, uh, means they are the son of somebody else. And so some people say when he took the name Bar Jesus, he is using Jesus' name. The word is, he's gotten word ahead of time about the Jesus movement. So he changes his name to Bar Jesus to kind of claim he has some power. Some people think that. Again, this is one of those things from argument of silence. We don't know. This is a guess. I wouldn't put a, a, a tremendous amount of stock in that. But because Jesus actually is a very popular name at that time, we often think about it um, maybe in the Spanish. We think about how popular Jesus is. It's a very popular name, not so much in the English. We don't name our kids Jesus, most of us. And um, so, you know, this simply could have been his name. He has another name, which is a translation for that he practiced magic and so forth. Um, it seems like for these individuals, um, they had some type of ability to do something to gain some prominence among the people. I mean, I guess if uh, David Copperfield, we, we didn't got, walked around and was able to make things disappear, we might think that guy knows something we don't. We now sort of categorize it as magic or illusion or whatever, but my... My, I wonder if this is what's going on with some of these people that they figured out sleight of hand or in some big ways that were sort of awe-inspiring to people and then they claimed to have power by it. Um, we don't really know. But he's, so he's traveling with this other guy, this proconsul, this Sergius Paulus, who um, Luke calls an intelligent man. He's a wise man. And uh, so this wise man wants sort of these people around him that sort of can do this attracted to that and so he hears that somebody is proclaiming this word of God and this power with it and so he wants an audience so he, he summons them and then uh, the magician opposes them 
and tries to say, don't follow them, that's not right. And, you know, there's this sort of a power battle that happens. And now we have this reference in verse 9 that from here on out, we, we don't get this sort of um, name change like we do in scriptures. We did a, uh, it was a last Sunday, Abraham to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah. We don't really mention it, it just says, also known as Paul. But then, from here on out, we drop Saul and it is now Paul. So it's just sort of like his Roman name more, if you will. Saul would certainly be his Jewish name, thinking of the first king of Israel. Paul may have been his Roman name, but from now on, I don't know if Luke, some person said, you know, Luke's writing and they're out in the Gentile area. So it's sort of like they dropped the Jewish part of his name and went with Paul because that would make other people recognize that this guy, he's named like a Roman citizen. And so maybe that helped, helped a little bit. Um, but... So we get this, so from now on it is Paul, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, we talk about, um, you know, Peter was, we got this sense that Peter didn't mess around a lot with the other disciples and with life. We kind of get this sense that Peter jumped in the pool first, um, actually walked on the water first, if you will. He, he act, reacted quickly. Um, was sort of an impulse reactor to things. Well, Paul's sort of an impulse speaker of things, to put it night. He calls things out very quickly and kind of, um, let's say we would say, that person's very direct with their speech. That's going to be a characteristic of Paul. He doesn't mince words when somebody sort of rises, uh, gets his dandruff up, so to speak. He goes right at it. And so here we are. He looks intently which we get that once in a while, that phrase looks intently and says, you son of the devil. Um, and so he goes right all at him. And will you stop making crooked the paths of um, the straight paths of God? Now, we think about what was John the Baptist's message was to make straight the crooked paths. OK, so he's saying you're undoing this is against God. And uh, so he calls him right on it. And then, of course, what happens to him? He is struck blind for a while, something that Paul must have been very familiar, we know was very familiar with, so that was the thing he went with. And so he is um, struck blind. It just says for a while. Paul doesn't make it, uh, he says it's only temporary, just like Paul's was. And then, um, he, well, it's like, he's a proconsul, saw what had happened and he believed. Well, I think all of us may be there, we, at least we were going to say we believed till we got out of the room, right? Because we would be next, so... Is this guy a convert or not? Because he's astonished at what happened, but is he more, is this a conversion of fear? Um, like if I don't, I say the wrong word, so we really don't know, but uh, we have this sense that um, the proconsul is like, yeah, this, I think I know which side has the power. Okay. All right, let's go on then to a next section. This is rather a long section. Um, and so we can maybe divide this up a little bit because we're going to get into some repetitive nature of the, the cycle of the story that happens. So let's see if somebody would read. Um, let's go 13 to 25 at first here. Somebody wouldn't mind tackling that. All right. Thank you. 
Thank you. Would somebody pick up and then we'll go 26 to 41? Okay. Keep, keep going down to 41 if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, go ahead and read 41 if you want. Mind. Look, you scoffers, be amazed and careless, for in your days I am doing a work, a work that you will never believe, even if someone tells you. And then if we can go 42, um, somebody to 52 to end, close out the chapter. Thank you. Okay, I'm reading, the reason I'm taking this big chunk at a time, usually we won't do such a large chunk together, is because we're seeing this cycle now of this storytelling of the Jewish history by these apostles to the Jewish leaders of the synagogue. And it's like, um, again, talking, it's, it's sort of like they sit there and hear this story. It, it, it's like uh, a pastor coming into a, a group of pastors and says, now, there was this guy named Noah, and there was this guy named Moses. And, you know, and you sit there, and we, okay, we've heard this, but the points of the story that um, they emphasize are the fulfillment of the Jesus story, the narrative that takes us to the promise, the Messiah being recognized among them. And so we have this pattern repeated. So I'm not going to go over the story because we've done this now several times here, but the writer of Luke, is taking the time, every single incident so far, and sort of giving this speech 
over and over again to sort of as as because even as the message goes out to the Gentile world, it is still very much the fulfillment of the Jewish history. We're, he's not letting that go. Okay, and so that that's important. All right, so let's look at uh, look at verse thirteen here and um, and and look at the movement. But first of all, let's note on here. Look at the listing of the names now. 13, remember we have this group of people listed at the beginning of the chapter. Now, verse 13 says, Then Paul and his companions. See how it's flipped now? The script is flipped. Paul is now the clear-cut leader. All right? And now if we look at our back at our map, we see that they leave the island of Cyprus, Paphos, and, and they now travel up uh, to Perga, and we begin this sort of into, this is like the area of Turkey today. And they begin this, and of course, on the Sabbath day, verse 14, where would they go on the Sabbath day? The Saturday. They, you know, these are still practicing Jews. They're still, um, of the Jewish faith, they're still worshiping God and going to this place. It also mentions here, I, I wanted to say before that, it mentions they came to Antioch. In Pisidia, this is di a different Antioch. This is not the Antioch they left back uh, near the Holy Land, okay, in Syria, okay? This is a different Antioch, just like we have a bunch of towns in our place renamed to in different areas, okay? So what's interesting here is that in that verse it says, John, however, left them and returned to Jerusalem. So now we have John Mark going back, back to Jerusalem. So he leaves uh, this group. That's going to come back up again. Uh, some say, why does he leave? What's going on here? It's sort of hard to tell. Um, they said, you know, the travel from to go to Perga was over the mountains, and did he just say, yeah, I'm not doing that? Or was this incident with the magician, like, going, I don't know if I'm cut out for this. This isn't my gift. I'm going to go back to Jerusalem, okay? So John does leave them. And then what we have here um, the, is the invitation uh, Paul is a Pharisee. To it's sort of like um, and, um, somebody coming to our church that is um, a leader of the Lutheran Church, and they're here. We'd say, "Well, just what's going on with the synod? What's going on with the church?" We would invite them to say a few words. So it's very um, customary that Paul, being from Jerusalem, a Pharisee, he stands up. He's invited to speak, and then we have this really what uh, some consider the very first um, sermon of Paul, if you will. And so he's invited. He begins with that Old Testament history, much like the other apostles did when they were arrested. Uh, just a couple of notes here about his speech. Um, verse uh, 24, before his coming, John, this is not the John that's left them. This, in fact, this time, this John is John the Baptist, okay? I just pointed out because this, this naming of names gets confusing as we navigate through this. Uh, another point that is a rare moment is that in verse 33, he has fulfilled for us their children by raising Jesus as it's also written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I have begotten you. What's interesting about this citation is rarely do we get an exact place in the Old Testament where this is written. So even at that time, the Psalms are already numbered. It says the second Psalm. And now he goes on and he'll say late, later on, on 35, he also said in another Psalm, that's typically how they reference it, they'll just say it like that, but here's a rare place where it's numbered by, it's called out by name. Also in verse 35, it says, you will not let your Holy One experience corruption. By corruption, it means decay of the body, okay? This is a person dying away, and so that David experienced this, even though he was the great king, but Jesus um, does not. And so he gives a speech, and, um, you know, this is where they're usually, you know, everybody in the companion is like, where's the exit, where's the door, we got to get ready, because now that Paul's done, or we got to get ready to run, because we're going to be arrested, we're going to be in big trouble, and uh, lo and behold, they get to finish the entire speech, and as they're going out, people say, what, 42? Come back next Sunday. Come back next Sabbath, which would be Saturday. But come back next week and do this again. They're kind of like, whoa. They're not used to this kind of reception among them. And even as they're breaking up, 
uh, on the, out in the parking lot, if you will, as they're getting into their Subarus. Um, the, the many Jews and devout converts to Ju Judaism, they follow them. And they want to know, well, we want to hear more about this. Um, and urge them to continue in the grace of God. So this, this really happens here. It is a success. And so they are invited to come back. And so Paul and Barnabas go, okay, um, we're coming back. By the way, I failed to mention that they date this all happening when they leave um, Antioch. What is surprising to me is this is 14 years after Paul has converted to Christianity from Judaism. It's been that long a time. I, in my own mind, I think of Paul being converted, boom, 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 and he does all these things and he's out into the world. But this actually is 14 years after that, around that type period that they finally set out. So um, we have sort of this sense of the history of Antioch, the time spent there, and, and Paul learning and teaching and stuff like that. But they eventually get on the road and, and share this. So they're going out. Things like things are going pretty well here. And next Sabbath, is people going to come back and hear? Well, yes, not only that. In verse 44, not only do the people come back to hear, but what? The whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Uh, but when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and blaspheming. They contradicted what was spoken by Paul. So they were good with it, but then they saw how popular it became. And then they're like, well, wait, they, these guys aren't so good after all. It's a very human response. It's about power. It's like the pastor getting a supply pastor. He preaches a great sermon, and everybody invites him back next Sunday, and the pastor comes back and goes, well, he's, well let me tell you something about him or her, because they're not that great. Uh, there's that jealousy, you know. Don't, you know, I, I, I always, you know, you say to the supply pastor, I always say they really, if you preach under a half an hour, they really like it 45 minutes, your sermon. So I, I want them to do that. So then the next week I come back, people are like, oh, you're back. Um, so they welcome you back because otherwise, if they're too good, then you know, they're like, oh, you're back. You know, you know so um, it's, but here we have some jealousy. It says right in the text, they are filled with jealousy because look, the whole people show up. It's like Christmas Eve or Easter morning and it's just a regular Sunday and everybody came to hear what was going on, including people outside the Jewish faith. And so what the pattern has been, as human behavior is, they begin to speak out and then, a call, of course, Paul and Barnabas don't take this line down and, and says it was necessary uh, verse 46, that the word be spoken first to you. There is the sense among that the, the message does come through the lineage and the promise of the covenant of the Old Testament down to Jesus. The Jews definitely have a special place in this message. They are the receiver, the recipients of this line, of this word. And so um, it was spoken first to you. Since you reject it, you judge yourselves to be unworthy of eternal life. We are now turning to the Gentiles. I think we would say even that God intended it to be for the entire world all the time. And um, he quotes, I have set you to be a light for the Gentiles, salvation to the ends of the earth. We still, call, we still use that language today, this little light of mine. We talk about the ends of the earth and sharing the gospel light very much in our vocabulary, very much in our mindset as we carry out and share the good news of Jesus Christ. And then um, we are told when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad. They're very happy because the outsiders are now included. And so there's joy to that. And, um, but Jews aren't going to take this line down. And so they incited the devout women in 50, it says. Now, um, in high, of high standing, what this means is that um, they believe that these are the spouses of some of the leading officials of the town. And so they get to them by getting to their wives, okay? And so that they can stir up trouble, and so that uh, persecution happens, and they drive them out of the region. We get this shaking the dust off their feet. That is something they did to, uh, as part of their culture to show that rejection. And then they go on, if we look at the map, the Iconium, to see where they go from uh, there. And they go to Iconium, and where Paul and Barnabas, what did they do? Um, they're going to go into the next synagogue. 
um, and we begin chapter 14. But it says, the final verse of 13, the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So even though they're driven out, there is a joy here. They would call this a successful mission. People were embracing the word of God, the story of the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. And so it's a way in the church sometimes that we can view our own sense of rejection as a church as we try to share the word that we can get caught up by um, the people who choose not to or the people who do. And um, it's one of those things where if we want to focus on those who rejected, you're going to be of a certain mind frame versus those who received. Um, and Jesus always talked about it being this way. Remember the seed being scattered on the different types of uh, soil that it lands on, that it's, and, and in the smallest of the mustard seed becoming big, that it, it's never about trying to make it, let's package this to get the most people, but rather let's stay authentic and true to it, and if people reject it, we move on. And we shake the dust off our feet. and We don't try to seek revenge. All right, let's look at uh, 14, the first um, seven verses of 14. If somebody would read that, please. Thank you. Okay, so if we look at our map here, they went from Antioch to Iconium, and now Iconium down to Lystra and Derby in, the, in this passage. So we kind of see where the tracks uh, are heading. Um, uh, this is a new place um, that they are going to, and they go by um, how they get there. This actually happens to be a place archaeologically um, where the uh, Roman uh, highway, and there's parts of that you can still see today, where the Imperial Highway um, was built, and and this so this would have been a major passageway that they travel to go there. Um, and it was remember we talk about how the Romans are famous for the their roads into the world with their they built it not so people could travel and go on vacation they built it so that they get their military where they wanted to very quickly but uh of course it is the roads that um allow greater travel and greater influence in the culture which makes a big uh deal um for the spreading of the gospel as well and of course the unbelievers um, poison their minds, that sense of uh, uh, let's, be, let's do fake news to them and uh, so that there's untruth, so there's division. Boy, something that never happens anymore, thank goodness. Uh, and it says there, but what do they do? Uh, it says in verse 3, so the result was they remained for a long time. They just didn't go, well, this isn't working, let's get out of here. In this case, they continue to remain. Uh, but when it starts to the point where they say, well, we have a plan to stone them, then they said, well, maybe it is time to move on. Let's get out of Dodge. And, and they do. And they then move to Lystra and Derby. And so let's take a look at what happens there in 8 through 20. Somebody wouldn't mind uh, reading that. Thank you.
Okay, so this is the Lystra experience, okay? And so we begin, they hear him, they, they go and they encounter this man who is crippled from birth. And then it says in verse 9, he listened to Paul as he's speaking, and then Paul looked at him intently. We get that phrase again. It's, it's, it's like when my mother across the room, when I was doing something in church or whatever, would give me that look, I knew it was time to buckle down. And you probably, if you're a parent, you've given that to your child too when you're trying so hard not to act or say anything. Um, uh, but you try to give the look and put the fear of God in your children in a sense uh, to behave. Uh, but Paul, there's this focus on Paul. He looks at him intently, sees that he is a believer and heals him and stand upright. And when this happens, of course, now, again, we are in major Gentile territory now. We're not in areas, the, 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 the Jewish folks in these synagogues here are the, very much the minority, okay? So their, their culture is not dominant. We are full into Roman culture here, which the Roman culture, we've talked about this three-layer cake, is still the Greek culture that still dominates now with Roman names, um, even though here these are the Greek names of the gods and not the Roman names. I believe Zeus is, is it Jupiter? I believe Zeus is Jupiter in Rome, and I think Hermes is Mercury, if I'm correct on that. But see, it, it, there's just a sense of how dominant the culture that here we are in 2021 we can name be, because of the dominance of that, that culture, how it impacted the world. So they compare it to what they know. Oh my gosh, we've heard these stories all our lives of these people, and there's actually uh, a, a story about Zeus and Hermes in the, Ro in the Greek mythology coming to earth and walking around. So they're going, here it is, here, here's what we've heard about. They react that way. And of course, um, the, the priests of the temple get word of this, and they want in on this as well, so let's load up, let's get going, we're going to make the sacrifice. Uh, there, the temple's on the outside town, they come in, and they got the garlands, they're ready to, you know, and, and this is one of those things where if Paul and Barnabas were doing this for power, here was an opportunity to become the gods on earth. They could have rode this thing how much, right? They could have t seized this moment and, and become powerful. And, but no, they are not Joel Osteen. And so they decide to um, do something different, and they remain true to the gospel. And um, they come out, and what do you do when you show great distress was a sign of their culture, was you tore your garments. Remember, the high priest, when Jesus says he's something about he tears his garment. So it's like the major thing you can do. I don't know what it is today. Maybe we would spit on somebody. I don't know um, what we would do to show that somebody has offended us or we are so taken aghast by what they do. Um, but this is what they did. They tore their garments. They ran their, their clothes. And they, and they don't just go down front. They run out into the middle of them and do this. This is, they want this to stop right now. Um, and what even is interesting about this is that um, 18 says, even with everything they say, what? Even with these words, they scarcely restrain the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. So even though they do all these things, they're barely able to keep this thing in a jar. Okay? So you can see the power of what's happening. And so, um, meantime, the folks that are stirred up from the nearby town say, we're not going to let this go. They're going to go poison other people. Let's go get them. And so they come in, they get the other uh, folks that are rejecting them, and they get together, and this time they're successful. They, um, drag, they, they stone Paul. They stone him, they drag him out of the city, supposing he's dead. They put him through, and they leave him. And then it said, but when the disciples surrounded him, and that was a practice that we even heard back in Stephen, but when somebody was stoned, eventually those of, who would take care of the body would surround that person. And so they are perhaps coming now to get Paul's body. They discover that um, he is alive, and he goes up and goes into the city. And the next day, um, he went on with Barnabas to uh, Derby. So they move on. And Paul probably was not having a feeling pretty good uh, after that happened. But let's uh, move on, and then um, 
Let's pick up uh, the last part of this chapter 14, 21 through 28. If somebody wouldn't mind reading that. Thank you. Okay, so um, they bring the good news to Derby. Um, it, you know, goes pretty well there. Same pattern. Luke does not go into details there. Uh, and then what do they do? They retrace their steps, basically, and go back, which is sort of amazing when you think of how the terms that they left each time with their life. But they're brave enough. They go back. Uh, and that says in 22, what did they do there? They strengthened the souls of the disciples. Think about persecution, things being done to strengthen one's soul. They didn't get, it doesn't say they went back and got rid of the persecution. No, they went back and strengthened their souls and encouraged them to remain true. And then we start to see the beginnings of structure happening. They appoint elders. They look around and say, you, you, you folks here, you, you have the gifts. You kind of run things. We are leaving. And so you still, we have now structure starting to happen in the church more and more. Um, they, pray, they With prayer and fasting, they entrust in the Lord. Again, the fasting coming up again as a practice that is just, we probably have, we don't do that in our culture near as much. It is practice, but not near as strong as it certainly was then. And then we get this word of how they retrace their steps to go back. The only thing they don't do is they leave. They don't go by uh, Barnabas' hometown. They don't go to the island of Cyprus. They go straight back to Antioch. They go to the church. is still happening there. They call everybody together, and they tell the story of uh, what's happening and how more and more people are becoming uh, believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it says it stayed there for some time. All right? So that's where I want to wrap up uh, today, and we'll start next week with uh, chapter 15. Any questions before we end? Okay, thanks everybody.